All right, time to put a bow on chapter nine. Um, last lecture uh, in this module, module six. Um, so 6G, and now we're focusing squarely on Skinner, Mr. B.F. Skinner. And so the white rat had to make its appearance. <laughs> this, this really is the dawning of rat psychology, what people call rat psychology. Um, you know, Skinner really kind of... Um, Took, took behaviorism to that sort of next level. So it took where Watson left off and really kind of ran. And, and as you'll see, a lot of what, what um, Skinner did was, um, oh, well, let's actually, sorry, let me show you the slide. There we are, Skinner. A lot of what he did was actually define the procedures and the methods and create apparatuses, apparati. Uh, and, and so he really kind of, um, you know, formally defined the laboratory practice of psychology, at least with respect to sort of rat research. Uh, and, and certainly that way of doing psychology was very much alive when I was a student of psychology in the, in the 1980s. Uh, there were a lot of behaviorists still around. There were a lot of behavioral labs uh, in, in universities. There still are some by the way. Um, but of course, everything's kind of gotten more complex since Skinner's day. So let's just jump right in with Skinner. And, and let me begin by saying, you know, the thing that really um, separates him from Pavlov, especially, so we call Pavlov, Pavlov's kind of learning uh, classical conditioning, we call Skinner's kind of learning operant conditioning. Um, and there's a there's a really important difference. So before we even look at any of this with respect to, to Skinner for a second, let's just remember Pavlov. How did Pavlov's um, process work? Well, we started with some pre-existing relationship, say between food and drooling, and then we added something like a bell. And if the bell predicted the food, then the animal might start to respond to and drool to the bell. Right. And so this explained in the real life, this explained things like what Pavlov was seeing, like how could the dog begin to anticipate food, you know, just when that person walked into the room. So Pavlov's theory explained how uh, behavior could become a lot more complicated. It's not always directly in a result. Res, uh, response to a eliciting stimulus, the stimulus that, you know, uh, what, what before we would call a UCS, a stimulus that produces that response, but it can actually generalize to other stimuli that predict it. So he sh began to show us how behavior could become more complex than, you know, a very simple, I get food in my mouth, I drool. Um, Skinner now, let's go back to this now, took it the next step. So he said, okay, that's cool how you can kind of connect a new stimulus, a bell with an existing relationship and create sort of a new relationship between the bell and that response. Cool. What Skinner showed is how you could create brand new SR relationships. You didn't have to build on existing ones. You could create brand new ones. But the important thing that differentiates Skinner is this third step we're going to talk about, the consequences of behavior. Pavlov never talked about the consequences. He was talking about the ability of a stimulus to predict something, right? Um, whereas Skinner's going to be, uh, he's going to have a more general kind of view. And, and his view is just this. Hey, listen, an organism finds itself in some situation. It does something within that situation. And there's consequences. Um, and what Skinner said is these consequences, now we're going back to Thorndike, remember, law of effect. If these consequences are good, they're more likely to make that response occur the next time the organism is in this stimulus situation. If this consequence is bad, then it's less likely that this response will occur in the future when the organism is in this situation. Um, and so first of all, you know, he really extended the Thorndike idea. So that idea is very much a Thorndikean idea. Wow, he can say these things. Um, but he really kind of ran with it, right? So, so Skinner said, okay, let's talk about these consequences. And let's first of all, realize the complexity of consequences. So first of all, some consequences can be good and some consequences can be bad. And so he talked about those as reinforcers or punishers. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, punishing, I, I don't like the word punishment here. Uh, I'll explain why in just a moment, but I'll, but I'll come back to that. Uh, the critical thing was a reinforcer was something that made that response more likely in that condition. 
what in this thing is called punishment is something that makes it less likely in that condition. So when I went back here, I said, if a good thing follows, then this is more likely in that condition. That would be called a reinforcer. Uh, if a bad thing follows, then this response is less likely in that condition. That would be a punishment. So he said there's actually subtypes of this. So if we think of the reinforcers, the good things that can happen, well, one good thing that can happen is we can actually gain something good for doing what we want. So here it says, you know, you say to your dog, sit, that's the stimulus, it sits, that's the behavior. And if you give it a treat for doing that, um, now you've given a positive reward. And, and that's gonna make the dog more likely to sit when you say that word in the future. Okay, now you could also remove something negative. And that's a good thing too, right? So these are all the world of good things, good consequences. So if we get specifically, you know, turning off an alarm clock by pushing a snooze button, he calls this escape, okay? So you have this noxious stimulus suddenly <laughs> blasting in your ear. Well, if you hit it, it shuts up. Right. Um, and that's a good thing. <laughs> You've escaped a negative stimulus and that's a good thing. Uh, and so that's going to make it more likely when you hear that noise, you're going to hit it again. Right. Um, and so that's that's also a reinforcement. It's a negative reinforcement. It's losing something bad. Um, the, another way to lose something bad is to um, actually avoid something bad in the first place. So in this case, we escaped something that was there. Here we can avoid it in the first place, active avoidance. So the idea he's saying here is, is, is if you engage in study, you know that if you didn't study, you'd get a bad grade. And so by studying you, I mean, you can think of this in two ways, right? You can think of it as giving yourself a good grade. This is always a little tricky, but he, but he's describing now is avoiding a negative grade. And so if you study and if you do succeed in avoiding that negative grade, that's going to make you more likely to study in the future. A little bit of hair splitting on some of these, but but you get the idea. These are positive things. And when it comes to negative things, you can just add a noxious stimulus. Um, so spanking a child for cursing, you know, that's a bad thing. If you do something and you get spanked, you don't want to do that again. Uh, most people anyway. <laughs> um, negative behavior. Um, sometimes you, you remove something positive, just like we removed something negative with the alarm clock, we can remove something positive. So we could have a, a child that was watching TV, but they were watching it too loud and too loud. And we said, turn it down, turn it down. And they did not turn it down. And we said, okay, because you did not turn it down, we're going to turn it off and you're going to your room. You're going to get no TV for a while. Um, so really what you're doing is removing something good from the child's world, right? Uh, that's what we call negative punishment uh, in this case. Um, you're punishing them by removing something good. Now, the only reason I kind of didn't like punishment is punishment sounds nasty, and this kind is, right? When you, when you add something negative to a person's world, that is kind of nasty, and that is punishment. A lot of people think that, that the sort of time out, removing something good, that punishment might be the wrong way to think about it, that what it might be is that you earn good things by doing, by behaving right. And if you don't behave right, well, then you just don't earn those good things. And so you lose the good thing um, by doing that. So it's it's not really a punishment so much as it's, it's a good thing that's contingent on good behavior. Uh, and that's how people like to often describe it to kids. It's not that you're bad or evil, but those good things, they depend on you doing good things. And if you haven't done the good thing, you don't get the good thing. That's just how it works. That's life. Yeah. So anyway. Big story is Skinner laid all this out and, and he didn't just lay it out. He did a bunch of experiments to show how these different kinds of rewards affected behavior. And he also looked at something called schedules of reinforcement. Um, you know, do you, do you um, always give the dog a treat every time it sits or do you give it a treat every second time it sits or every third time it sits? How does that change his learning of the, of, of sitting when you, uh, when you say the word sit, you know, as a function of how you give the, the rewards. So uh, Skinner was really kind of trying to look at this universe, which he thought was a, a miniature version of the real world that does exactly this kind of thing to us all the time, reward us or punish us for behaving in certain ways in certain situations. Uh, and so he just kind of brought it down to a lab. Um, yeah, okay, let's watch a little bit. Okay, so 
Now that I look at this, what was that? Was that classical conditioning or was that operant conditioning? Um, that was more classical conditioning, wasn't it? That was more Pavlov, just as the guy as the guy suggested. So, so uh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> Hopefully you detected that. Uh, but um, there, there's something I want to grab from this example as well, which is not an operant conditioning example. Gee, that's a that's be a classical conditioning example. Wow. Okay. Um, but but you get the idea there. Um, the bell preceded um, the Altoid, which gave him the good taste in his mouth, and uh, I don't know. Actually, that's kind of a complicated one. They don't really have anything right. Well, yeah. So it's more, wow. So this, this I, I'm gonna like this example. Um, I'm gonna like it because it's messed up. <laughs> because when you actually try to think of what was going on there, there were sort of, uh, this is a good example of how complex behaviorism can be, um, quite honestly. Because he had the bell, and then he asked him, do you want an Altoid? And then Dwight put out his hand and said, sure. And then he got an Altoid and then he got a good taste in his mouth. So he got a positive reward for engaging in the sort of classical conditioning step. So normally you'd say Altoid, you'd say, sure, Altoid, sure. Uh, and so now really the core of this is classical conditioning, right? Because he said, Bing, Altoid, sure, Bing, Altoid, sure. And then it was just Bing and he got the behavior. So that was really classical conditioning. But we also have this element where after engaging in the classical conditioning, Dwight got the, the reward which he's kind of missing now. Um, so anyway, wow, was that complex, but it's not operant conditioning. So ignore this slide, not operant conditioning. Um, not really, um, but it gives you an example and, and you can find these, these um, sorts of examples uh, online and some of them are, are quite funny. Okay, so, so much for that bad example. Pfft. Should have just went by. Um, let me just um, here we go. A couple of a couple of cool issues that I want to. There's there's a bunch in the textbook, and I'm not going to cover everything in the textbook. And yes, you are responsible for it. Uh, but I'm going to highlight a couple of things about Skinner, and I'm not even sure the textbook hits this one as hard as I will. But I think it's a critical one, especially when you know all along we were talking about people trying to understand consciousness. Uh, what what is the what what is what are the characteristics of consciousness right so that goes back to Vlint and others with the whole introspectionist idea um, and and then we get to the functionalist you know what is the function of consciousness um, Skinner is an extreme Skinner believes that phenomenal consciousness this consciousness that's going on in our minds that we are sort of privy to the thoughts and such and experiences that we are living in our minds are epiphenomenal. Let's get there. So here's what Skinner thought happened. After years and years of interacting with the world, we've developed all of these stimulus response connections through the way we have been rewarded and punished. And so at any given time, we are in some situation and that situation is similar to some that we've been in in the past and and we've done things in those situations in the past some of those things have led to rewards some of those have led to punishments and that whole reward history what he thought is weighed by the brain so when we're in this situation right now the brain will choose the behavior that maximizes the rewards and minimizes the punishments and then we and that's how we will behave and this is done without conscious thought this is the brain just saying do this but what Skinner thought is we are not aware of, of this sort of mental al calculus that's going on. We are not aware of our reward history. We can't remember all those facts. None of this is done consciously, not really. I mean, he calls it functional consciousness, but not really. It's really a question of uh, almost a reflex that we've been programmed by our reward history um, to behave in a certain way in this situation. And that's the way we're gonna behave. Now, if somebody suddenly says, why did you do that? Well, now we have phenomenal consciousness. And this is kind of related to that previous video where he's going, my mouth feels whatever. Why does my mouth feel? And if you really pushed him, why does your mouth feel like that? If you didn't remember any of the learning, why does your mouth feel like that? He would probably come up with a story like, I don't know, I must have just had my mouth closed too long and been breathing through my nose or something like that. This is what Skinner thought our consciousness did, that it kind of observed our behavior. Um, it was, it's there, it's real, but it's not really 
playing a role in shaping our behavior. All it does is explain it to ourselves and others afterwards. We use consciousness just to explain things, but it actually has no control over our behavior. Skinner is very extreme in that regard. So he's not denying the existence of consciousness, but he's saying it is a secondary phenomenon that is a byproduct of another phenomenon. The byproduct, it is a byproduct of the brain doing things. So the brain is doing things and solving all sorts of stuff. And for some reason, that results in these thoughts and ideas coming into our head. But the thoughts and ideas are byproducts of the main process. They are not the main process. Um, and so he was very strong this way and, and really to the point of almost being depressed. I heard him in one interview of really, you know, convincing himself consciousness plays no role at all in what we do. Um, and, and as an older man that, that bothered him, but he believed it. Okay. So he's an extreme and most other people aren't quite there with him. Um, you've probably heard it a few times in the textbook that, that uh, you've heard the claim that consciousness is really important every time we have a, a novel act to perform or if we want to do something that goes against our habits, that's where a lot of people see conscious uh, experience having some sort of controlling thing. But a lot of people do believe for those things that we've done over and over and over, those things that have become habit, that this is sort of true, that quite often our body will just behave. And so our behavior often is a function of what we would call unconscious influences. That's what um, Skinner really highlighted. But most of us think we also have conscious in, in influences that can kind of override those unconscious influences or take control in situations where there are no appropriate unconscious influences. Okay, so just to tell you sort of where the field is, but that's where Skinner is. And he's the strong foil against consciousness playing any role, which is kind of cool. I always found that interesting. Um, the other thing, of course, I'll just mention quickly, and it's highlighted a lot in the book, is, is Skinner was also good at sort of systematizing the way people did research by creating things like apparatus. So he created a little world for his rat where he could control the stimuli that were presented, um, which could be sounds or lights or whatever, or electric shock if he wanted to present electric shock. So electric shock could be a consequence, but a food pellet could also be a good consequence. The rat has a bar where he could press. Um, and so he created these things called Skinner boxes and he could do very precise experiments. Um, in fact, this bar press, he later linked up to something called a cumulative recorder that could measure every behavior in very clear ways. Did the rat press the bar sufficiently hard or not? So it led to a very objective approach to studying the way that stimuli affect behavior. And there is absolutely no doubt that psychology learned a lot there. Behaviorism was not some little foray into uselessness. Um, it was in fact a time when we learned a whole lot about how learning works and learning is a big part of who we are. Um, and so, you know, Skinner's contributions to systematizing the way we do that are, are very powerful. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit more about that in the textbook too. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, there's two, la two things I want to talk about Skinner that I just couldn't resist talking about. So the first is his teaching machines. You guys are going through M-Tuner um, now. This is, M-Tuner is the shadow of this. Um, so uh, Skinner said, you know, for, for, for an organism to learn well, it needs to be sort of rewarded or punished, you know, told whether it did something correctly the moment it does it. And he was worried that his classrooms got too large. Teachers can't do that now. They can't tell when a student has just done something right or done something wrong. Uh, and so they can't reward and punish. He didn't like negative punishment either, by the way. He didn't like, especially in the school system, um, he was worried about it. But he felt that students really needed to know when they'd done something right. And so he'd created a machine to do this where students would go in, and I'll, I'll let you read the, the, the details here, but the interesting thing to read, read it and then think about your M-Tuner um, uh, situation. The reason we created M-Tuner was there's a lot of evidence that suggests people learn while they're being tested, that students learn a lot. But here's the problem, and it's a Skinner problem. On a traditional test, if you pick C and C is wrong, but you don't know C is wrong, then you will associate C with that question and you will believe it's correct. And if we test you later, you will continue to think C is correct. But if C was wrong, we should have told you it was wrong. And we should have told you what was right 
before we let you go on, okay? If we want you to learn the right answer, we can't ignore when you're giving the wrong one. We have to correct it. Um, and so he talks about this, this complex way his machines did it. This is exactly what mTuner does. And this is exactly the idea. When I, when I talk about you know, what mTuner is about, I say it reinforces your accurate learning and while um, fixing your mix, misconceptions. You know, if you're picking wrong, we're going to get you back on track before you go. This is why, by the way, you should not be cheating on your M-Tuners. If you're cheating on your M-Tuners, you are cheating yourself and you are cheating your learning. Uh, and when you get to the final exam, I will see, oh, you were cruising right along on, uh, on M-Tuners and you sucked at the final exam. And I'll know exactly what that means. Um, so... If you do the M-Tuners right, you're going to be enhancing your learning and you're going to be ready for that final exam. That's the idea of the M-Tuners. So if any of you have not been doing them right before, might be a good time to start. Um, that final exam is not that long away. Okay, um, cool. Last thing I'm gonna talk about for Skinner, because I wanna use this as a sort of lesson for all of you students. Serendipity, this kind of jumps all the way back to Pavlov. In fact, I told you in the Pavlov section, I think Pavlov is the poster child for serendipity. Um, but in fact, Skinner makes a big deal out of it in his career too. He says, you know, very often he was looking for something and then something else occurred that was way more interesting and he was smart enough to pivot. The pivot would be a modern word we use for this. Serendipity, the effect by which one accidentally stumbles upon something truly wonderful, especially when looking for something entirely unrelated. Pavlov was interested in how different foods produce different digestive responses. But he realized that animals were learning to anticipate the food, and he realized that was the truly wonderful thing. That was the cool thing. I mean, heck, he redefined a whole scientific discipline by, by mining that thing. Um, and it's probably, you know, made him much more famous than had he stuck with what he was focused on. Skinner claims the same thing made him a success. What I like to say to all of you guys, I have students all the time saying, um, asking me advice about how they should approach university and what they should do. And what I like to say is go in with a plan, right? Make sure you are looking for something, you know, go, go in there mindfully. So, you know, imagine you have a certain goal and what are the courses I need to go towards that goal. And so think in that way, but keep a mind out towards serendipity. You may find that while you're on the path to one place, certain other things reveal themselves to you that are in fact closer to your passions, stuff that you really do like, and you maybe didn't expect it. You know, maybe you take a philosophy course and suddenly it's like, uh oh, I think philosophy is kind of cool. I'm starting to like this. Let serendipity do its thing. And if you find yourself resonating with some issue or some topic or some other path, don't be too quick to dismiss it. It may be the path that you should be on. Um, so how's that for some deep? It says mybeautifulwords.com. I'll say this is deep words. And we will put uh, module six to bed with that. I will see you on module seven. I will say one other word just quickly. Um, I've been challenged to get the lectures up in time this week. You notice this is probably the latest I've been. Uh, I'm going to be challenged next week as well because we have another two chapters next week. Um, if you're feeling similarly challenged, um, let me just tell you what I'm telling myself. Uh, after next week, we start to do a chapter a week uh, for, for pretty much right up to the end. And even the end, it's two chapters, but the last chapter is almost nothing. So I did front load the, the, the reading a little bit more on this course because I know this is the time of term when you have projects and assignments and final exams are looming and you're studying. And so I was the notion was to you know, do a little bit more of the classroom reading stuff early in the course and then coast a little. So, so reduce the rate a little at the end. And, and we're coming up to that. One more week of, of hard, and then we're going a chapter a week. So if you can, you know, stick with me. Don't let yourself get behind. Um, stick with the course, and it's it's going to get a little easier in terms of the number of lectures every week and such. So hang in there. That's my pep talk. All right, I will see you in module seven. Bye bye.